We are in a series in the book of Acts, chapter uh, 18 is where we're going to be going today. And uh, what we're going to really look at today as a, a brief synopsis would be um, a little bit about Paul's heart for mission. We're going to recap Paul in Corinth and his heart uh, for mission for the Jewish people and for the Gentile alike. We're going to take a brief look at that. And then we're going to really go to boot camp for a few minutes today. We're going to get back to some of the basics of Christianity. We're going to reinforce them, the importance of understanding the foundations of our faith, our identity in Christ. So we're going to reiterate some of those very basic components of Christianity that sometimes we can forget about. So Acts 1.8 is our life verse for this series. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we're going to jump in and talk in a minute about Paul's heart for this kind of a verse and how important it is for you and I to uh, you know, focus our lives on advancing the kingdom of God, to live a life on mission. Earlier we shared about many of the compassion missions that we had during our offering period. That's one of the ways that we reach out here at Journey Church. We do so through many of these compassion ministries. We also do so through our small groups, through inviting people to church, and through simple acts of Christian kindness. Pastor Don might have mentioned the event we went to yesterday. Here's a quick glimpse of some of the things that we did out there yesterday. yesterday. Thank you for going out there. As you saw, it was nothing to fear. We were just hanging out, letting the community simply know that Journey Church exists with the hope that if they need to come to a place where they want to go to church, that they would show up at this place and know that people would love them, that the gospel would be preached. I got to give out a lot of dog bones. I mean, it was a lot of fun, and some kids even ate them, which was a little bit strange, but, but it, it was all good. And uh, we're going to be doing another outreach of similar fashion, just a simple act of Christian kindness in December. So if you didn't get to go this time, I encourage you to sign up the next time around. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into God's Word. Father, we thank you for this day. We want to honor you and praise you. And as I preach this message, would it be for me first, Lord God? Would you use it to continue to transform my heart, my mind, draw me deeper into a relationship with you, cause me to fall more in love with you all over again. And might you do the same for everybody who is here, whether they come to know you for the very first time or whether they are fully spiritually mature. Would you touch each of us and lead us in this lifelong journey of growing in the gospel and growing closer to you? Lord, have your will and your way in our hearts and our minds today in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. So a quick recap of what happened last week. Um, if you missed the message, I encourage you to go online. You could watch it at journeychurch.org. Uh, Paul was in the city of Corinth. It was a major city in the region. He was there and had an open door to minister there for 1.5 years. Some really cool things ended up happening because some very unlikely people ended up giving their lives to the Lord while he was in Corinth. So the first one of those unlikely people is Crispus. And Crispus was the leader of the synagogue. So Paul goes in there. He has an opportunity to speak. And Crispus, the Jewish leader of the synagogue, ends up giving his life over to Jesus and becomes a follower of Jesus. And there's a guy that takes over for Crispus as the new leader or president of the synagogue. And his name was Sotnus. And at first, Sotnus is very upset about what Paul is doing, about what he's teaching, about what he's preaching. So much so that he tries to go to the authorities to get Paul's message shut down. He goes and he says, you know, they're preaching against the word and, and you need to stop them. You need to beat them. You need to kick them out of town. And the authorities actually come back. The magistrate at the time says, 
Paul's doing absolutely nothing wrong. He has freedom to be able to preach here. He can continue to teach. And he goes outside, and the crowd actually turns on soapness, and he ends up getting the beating that was intended for Paul. Don't you love it when Jesus does stuff like that, right? The guy, you know, Paul's supposed to get beat, and then the other guy who was going to beat him gets a whooping. So it turns out that way. And then an even better miracle ends up happening sometime between the book of Acts and the time that the book of 1 Corinthians is written because the letter in Corinthians is addressed to our brother Sothness. So not only did the first leader of the synagogue get saved, the one who stood in opposition to God and tried to get Paul kicked out ends up getting saved himself. It was just a beautiful set of scriptures as we saw that nobody is too far from the reach of God to be touched, and I hope that you are glad and rejoice about that. We're going to continue reading today in Acts 18.18. 18. It says, after this, so after Corinth, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, at some word I can't pronounce, but we'll try, Sencre, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. So I want to use this next couple minutes to talk about Paul's heart for seeing people get redeemed and allowing God alone to get the glory in the midst of it. Um, it says that he took a vow. So as we put this in cap on his time and season in Corinth, he takes this vow. We don't know why. Scripture doesn't tell us why he takes this vow. The vow is commonly called a Nazarite vow, and it had a few things. They would not drink of the fruit of the vine. They would not touch bodies. That would not be a hard one for me to do. How about you, right? Not touch any dead bodies. And then they would not cut their hair which would seem interesting. So the closest analogy that we might have today is that of an Orthodox or Hasidic Jew. We've got a picture of one up here. So this would be maybe the imagery that you would get. You have a person with their beard extremely long, with their hair extremely long. Um, even to the Jewish people, of which half of my family is Jewish, so I could jokingly say this, these people look like super Jews. Do you know what I'm saying, right? These are super Jews. So the, even to the average, everyday Jewish person, when you look at somebody like this, it's kind of strange and kind of weird, right? When you've seen people like this, maybe in our culture, you're like, I don't understand. I don't, I don't know what they mean. Why are they dressed this way? Why is their hair that way? And that may have been a little bit of that disconnect that you would have also seen between the Roman or Greek cultures and the Jewish culture. These people were like foreign entities to them, right? So you get a guy like this trying to preach to Romans, that might seem to be a very odd thing. It would be very hard for them to receive from them. So as we dig into Paul's heart for a minute, there's a couple of different scriptures. One that we read last week, Acts 18.6, it said, And when they opposed and reviled them, meaning the Jews, he shook out his garment and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he's saying, I'm innocent. I'm trying to preach to you, my Jewish brothers. You're not receiving what I have to say. I'm going to my Jewish, or I'm going to the Gentiles. So why in the midst of saying that he's going to the Gentiles, does he all of a sudden become super Jew? He all of a sudden goes and he begins to grow his hair long. He begins to dress even more odd than the average everyday person that's there. He takes on this vow in the midst of it. I, I assert to you that he really never lost his love to see his brothers and sisters redeemed. He desperately wanted to see them redeemed. In Romans 9.1 it says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness to me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could not wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he has this heart's desire to see his people who he came from redeemed. He wants to see them come to know Jesus. And I pray that God would give us a little bit of that same heart. I see it exemplified here oftentimes. It's, it's a heart for people of our blood, of our family, of our heritage. Julio comes up. He exhibits that kind of a spirit. He comes up to me the other day and he says, Eric, you're doing all these daily devotionals and you're doing them all in English. Would you mind if I began to post them in Spanish so that we could reach Spanish-speaking people? I'm like, no problem. Go for it. Share it. He has a heart to see Spanish people redeemed with the love of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of spirit that Paul had here for the Jewish people. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, For though I am free from all, 
I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew or more Jewish. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So Paul was willing to become more Jewish, so to speak, so that he could win Jews. But he had great wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment about reaching people in a missional sense. He understood the context that he was in which makes it all the more odd, his other statement where he says that I'm leaving you, I'm shaking my clothes of you, and I'm going after the Gentiles. How could the Gentiles relate to what he's saying? Well, I believe part of the spirit here is that he wanted to ensure that God gets all the glory. He didn't want man to get any glory when Gentiles ended up getting saved in the midst of this. We have in our hearts idol factories. We look at people and we aspire to be like them. We have affection towards them. Sometimes it borders on worship, right? We look at our sports figures, our entertainment figures, even our pastors at times with places that are not necessarily healthy in our eyes. We put them up on a pedestal. We idolize them. We think of them as more than they should be. But God said, as we read last week, that he will use the foolish things at times to confound the wisdom of the wise. 1 Corinthians 2.1, and it says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So I assert to you that Paul had a heart and a love for the Jewish people. Even though he said, I'm done with you, I'm tired of you, he was still willing to do whatever it would take to see them come to know Jesus, even if it meant literally what he's saying, I would be willing to go to hell myself if it would mean that my Jewish brothers and sisters would come to know Christ. And then on the other hand, he had such a heart for the Gentiles that he wanted to make sure that no man would get the glory and it would be a miracle when they came to know Jesus. So he experienced both in the midst of that. So what's the learning for us? I would pray that God would endow the people of Journey Church with a heart of compassion for the people that he has called us to that he would give you a heart's desire somewhere deep within you that you would be willing to sacrifice your time, that you'd be willing to sacrifice your money, that you would be willing to sacrifice your skills, your abilities, you, you know, whatever it takes so that different people that you know who God has called you to might come to know him as their Savior and Lord. As one pastor said, hell is hot and eternity is long and we don't want anybody to go there. That's part of the heartbeat of mission. That was part of Paul's heart. He was willing to sacrifice everything with the hope that some would come to know Jesus is what it said. For us, I would go so far as to say that many would come to know Jesus. Not that Journey could get the glory, not that I could get the glory, not that any one of us might get the glory, but that these seats would ultimately be filled with people who don't know Jesus, who would come to know Jesus so that God could get the glory and they could be saved from the gates of hell. That's what this is all about. Can I get an amen? As we read on Acts 18, 19. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave from them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So in this simple set of statements here, we see something far different than anything that we've encountered in the book of Acts to date. In most of the situations, Paul would go into a city he would begin preaching in the synagogue. He would turn from the synagogue and go to another place in the city, and he would continue to communicate the gospel to Jew and Gentile alike in that city. And then he would generally want to get beaten or thrown out of the city was the typical pattern that happened. But here, Paul actually goes in for a very brief period of time. It says he left them there, and he continues on. We know that his heart was set on the city of Jerusalem. We know that that's where his destination was to be. But something very unique, 
unique and distinct happens here for the very first time that we see it in Paul's ministry. He leaves other people there to do the work. He had parents, Priscilla and Aquila, in the faith who had been raised up to such a place where he was confident leaving them in the city of Ephesus to do the ministry, to plow the ground, to sow the seed, knowing that one day he would return at a later date and the ground would be prepared all the more, that he would bear even greater fruit in that city of seeing people be redeemed, having left them there. Would someone be confident leaving you somewhere to advance the kingdom of God? Are you a place in your faith where you're mature, that you could be entrusted to share the gospel and confidence and encourage and faith that you could go out there and share the good news and just know that you're on fire with God? That's the place that we all need to get to, a place of spiritual maturity. So what we're going to talk about today is going back to boot camp for a minute with the hope that all of us would strive in our lives towards spiritual maturity, not out of some sense of just knowledge sake, but out of a sense of allowing the gospel to be rooted deeply in our life, that it would create a love for God, a love for others that would compel us to a life of mission. Acts 18, 22, it says, when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. And when he went down to Antioch, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia, Perga, strengthening all the disciples. So Paul bails. He leaves them there. He leaves them with a purpose. He leaves them with a mission, and he goes on to Jerusalem. While it's not mentioned there, we know that that is his destination from other writings. So here's where I want to hover today. Here's the scriptures I want to dig into, Acts 18, starting in verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, although he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of the Lord more accurately. And when he, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those through grace he had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So foundationally here at Journey Church, we believe that people who are not born again are called spiritually dead. They don't know Jesus. They're apart from the Spirit of God. They become born again. They become an infant in the faith. An infant grows to a child, a child to a young adult, a young adult to a parent. Part of the natural life cycle that we have in the natural that also occurs in the spiritual, right? So we encounter this guy, Apollos, not certain that he's saved or not. It says that the guy could articulate the scripture very clearly. He understood it, but he had a partial understanding, only discerning the baptism of John, right? He didn't have a full wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So some parents in the faith come alongside of Apollos, being Priscilla and Aquila, and they educate him more accurately in scripture and what he's teaching about. And ultimately, at the end, they send him off on mission to Achaia. And I'm not talking about Ikea, right? That place needs ministry too if you've ever been in there. They need a lot of help in that place. It's of the devil. I do not like going to Ikea. Um, You hear what I'm saying? The ladies are all like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The guys are like, I'm never going there. Swedish meatballs are not for me in Jesus' name. So you see this pattern that's exhibited in the midst of it. So I want to talk about that for a minute. I think it's vitally important. It's an imperative. I think that um, it was divine, but also lucky, so to speak, that for Apollos, there were some parents in the faith that were there in the city of Ephesus when he arrived. And when they saw him speak, they were able to speak into his life and help him grow. Um, the basics and the foundations are incredibly important. I had a couple of new realizations of that in my life this very week. One of them, um, I've been training in jiu-jitsu and martial arts for about 10 years off and on, and I was in the gym at Smiley's Place the other day. I was standing at the edge of the cage, and there was two young men who were in there, and they were training to get their first stripe on their white belt. They were doing some of the very basic moves that are there, and I was watching them, and a lot of the stuff I got, I'm like, okay, yeah, he's got to do this. He's got to do this little nuance, and then other stuff, I'm like, I completely and utterly forgot what you're supposed to do in that situation. 
I've been doing this for a long time, but I can't believe how much I've forgotten. I need to go back and take the Jiu-Jitsu 101 class again, man. I need to sit in there with the beginners and get the foundations of the basics back in my life because guess what? You're not going to be very good if you don't understand the basics, right? One of my other hobbies is shooting. I like to shoot paper, not people. I don't like to shoot beings. I don't like to shoot animals. I like to shoot at paper. And there's a saying in shooting that is, if you can't shoot slow and straight, then you have no business trying to shoot fast and straight. It's not going to happen. So what I mean by that is if you don't have the basics of markmanship down, if you don't understand sight picture and trigger control and grip and stance and these very basics that help you to shoot slowly and accurately, if you pick up the pace, you're just wasting bullets. You're not going to hit your target. You're going to miss the mark. You're never going to put it on paper in the way that it's supposed to do. You're just wasting money out there doing nothing fruitful in any way. I hope you can see the spiritual analogies. When we begin to forget about the basics and foundations of our faith, we can quickly get led astray. We can't discern any longer what is right or wrong. We can't discern any longer truth or lie. And we see that present in everyday life in Christianity today where Christians are falling into all kinds of winds of weird doctrine. It happens all the time. There's all kinds of craziness that goes on and part of Paul's ministry life in Corinth was dealing with some of the abuses, the people that were there. If you read the book of Corinthians, they were doing some cuckoo for Cocoa Puff kinds of things. I mean, guys sleeping with the other dude's mom and all kinds of weird stuff. You want to read some weird stuff? Go read the book of Corinthians. And he was addressing that in the life of the church. They had brought the culture that seemed normal to them into the church. And Paul saying, no, no, no. That's not how we're supposed to live. These things are not acceptable in the life of the believer. So they had to regain those foundations of the faith. Is this making sense to you so far? So we have a graphic that we use here in our partnership class and in our introduction. I'm going to ask them to put it on the screen. Um, I'm going to talk about this for the next few minutes so that we can reiterate what we feel is important here and why we feel it's important. There's a cross at the center of that diagram, and surrounding it is four words, image, worship, community, and mission. So the center of our life should be our relationship with Christ, our relationship with God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. God should be first and foremost in our life. That um, it should guide our thoughts, it should guide our directions, it should guide our actions, it should guide our decisions. Christ should be first in our lives. Our identity is composed of four things. Image, Genesis 1.26. We're created and formed in the image of God. We were not created to be first. We were created to be second. We were created to mirror God's image. When people gaze on us, literally Christians means that you are to be little Christ's. When they look at you, they should see Jesus in you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Albeit imperfect, certainly, we live in a fallen world. We all struggle with sin. We're submitting to the sanctification process and growing in that as we allow God to refine us and change us and transform us to image him better, right? So how do we do that? We do it through worship, right? Worship is not necessarily what we're doing here on Sunday. It's a component of worship. Worship when we gather together and sing musically is a component of worship. Gathering together corporately with the saints is a part of worship. Uh, The word being preached is a part of worship. But really and truthfully, all of life is worship. Everything you do, every action, every reaction, every decision is an act of worship. It reveals who and what you worship, and unfortunately, even for most Christians, what we will find is that God is not at the center of that diagram. For most of us, if we are honest, me, myself, and I is the Holy Trinity that is at the center of that diagram. My wants, my needs, my desires, it's all about me, mine, 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 is at the center of that. It's about what we want, it's about what we desire. Sometimes when dealing with other issues of life, um, we know that our Savior is Jesus Christ and we put our hope and our trust in Him, we say with our outward lips, but then when the rubber begins to hit the road and difficulties begin to arise in our life, we look for other functional saviors, we would call them idols, that we try to fill the gap that only God should be filling in our life. So what are some of those things? It could be for some of you in here, a relationship. 
Your relationship with Jesus Christ is not right. It's not in order. He is not first in your life. Something goes wrong. You feel inadequate in some way. You begin to fill that hole in that void with a relationship with somebody else that you shouldn't be sleeping with. That's one of the ways in which it happens. Others might fill that void and find a functional savior in entertainment. So you go out and entertain yourselves to death. You go to Garth Brooks all six times while he was in town this past couple weeks. You, walk the, you watch the Walking Dead marathon season every weekend. Come on, guys. you got some issues up in there. Some of you ladies, it might be your purses. It might be your dresses. It might be your shoes. It might be an addiction of some way, shape, or form, chemically, right? You begin to put these chemicals in your body so that you don't have to feel the pain. They give you these momentary reliefs. But God says that he is the prince of peace, that he is the God of comfort, that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. We're not supposed to fill those various voids in our life with other things that cross the line sometimes from being likes to being objects of our affection or worship. How do you know when you've crossed the line? Um, it, it's, it's a dotted line at times. It's hard to figure out at times. But generally, something that we worship requires three things, time, energy, and money. Time, energy, and money. How do you spend your time, your energy, and your money, Right? So let's use money as one of those things. Um, if I were to ask many of you in this room, is the right thing to do to tithe? Probably 90% of the people in this room would say, the right. I know what the Bible says. I know it says in Malachi 3, 9, 10. Okay, the Bible says I am supposed to tithe. And some of you know and do. You know it and you do it. But you do it just out of a sense of obligation. Um, you're like, I'm going to do it because I don't want God to zap me. I'm going to do it because some preacher told me that if I do this, I will be blessed and everything's going to be taken care of and I'm going to have a mansion somewhere. We do it for various reasons, but those aren't necessarily good motivations for doing that, right? But if you reverse the question also um, and you say, why don't you tithe? A number of the people that are in this room right now would say, you know, I, I don't have the money to tithe. It's not something I can do. And I would ask you why. And, and you, you'd probably say, well, you know, for some, I, I bought this car, and this car, I love this car, man, it is awesome, and it makes me feel really good when I'm driving this car, and I put all my money into this car, because it makes you feel good, it makes you feel a sense of comfort, it makes you feel a sense of power, or you put your money into your house, or you put your money into your clothes, and you did so, so much so that you now find yourself in debt, and you're enslaved to that debt, because you have been worshiping a false god that has stole your money, and possessed positions you at a place where you no longer have the resources to do what you know is right. Does that make sense to you? That's how idols work. They steal your time, your attention, your money. They want to keep you from worshiping the one true God. I was a cocaine addict, and man, cocaine was a jealous idol. It didn't want you to have no money left over to drink. It didn't want you to have no money left over to smoke weed. It didn't want to have you no money to left over to hang out with your wife. It didn't want to have no money to be left over for anything. And that's how idols work. Ultimately, the devil will use them to steal everything from you and leave you with nothing but emptiness. What are we to do when confronted with idols in our life? It says believers should go to war against them. Too much time in Christianity, we don't deal with this issue of repentance, and rather than going to war against the idols in our life, we allow them to sit there in our lives. So it's okay to come in and shack up and hook up and still go to church every weekend, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to watch porn. There's no problem with that. It's okay to use drugs. There's no problem with that. It's okay to spend yourself into oblivion. There's no problem with that. It's okay to watch yourself into TV into oblivion. There's no problem with any of that. Because culture seeps into the life of the church where it's not supposed to be, just as in the city of Corinth. And really, we need to go to war against these things in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't overcome them yourself. You need God to help you in that. Can I get an amen? That baby's going to provide a perfect example in just a moment. Don't run too far. We're going to go into that conversation about infancy and childhood and... Whew, Thank you for providing a great illustration. We love you guys. I lost myself. Come on, Jesus. Where was I at? All right. All right. Image, worship, community, right? So community. What is community in our generation? Some of you have a thousand Facebook friends, but no real friends in life. You have a lot of frenemies out there too, right? 
But you get what I'm saying? That, so th- there's this level of knowing in our life where we can go easily converse with somebody about news, weather, sports, these kinds of things. How the Gators do this weekend? How the Jaguars do? What's going on in life? How's work? How's the weather? Um, that kind of conversation happens oftentimes, but that's not the kind of community that God's describing here. He uses a different term. He calls it koinonia. It's, it's a depth of community that goes beyond simply knowing to feeling and communicating at a deeper level and growing and wisdom, knowledge, and understanding together of iron, sharpening iron, of helping one another. And when I say that stuff, some of you are getting creeped out right now. Like, that's why I don't go to a small group. You want to know some of the major reasons why? Because many have hidden sin in their lives. There's stuff going on behind the scenes in your life, hurt habits, or hang-ups that are preventing you from entering into community because if you go to that small group, you will be found out. Somebody's going to know that you've got issues. They already know you've got issues. They've got issues too. If we're in a healthy community, it's okay. We don't beat each other up over our issues. We help one another out when we have issues. We're there for one another. We love one another. We care for one another. That's the spirit and essence of it, but you can never truly live in community if there's a whole bunch of sin going on in the back of your life because you're going to try to disguise it by pretending or performing. You're going to pretend that everything's okay, and you're going to perform and try to do the right thing on the outside so nobody could ever know who you are when really you need the spirit of the living God to come in and transform you, and you need to get real with yourself and confess and repent if you were to grow up and become spiritually mature. Is all this still making sense to you? Have I lost anybody just yet? Going back to the basics today, one more to go on. We have mission. So out of a heart to image God well, out of a love for God as an act of worship, we live in community and we live a life on mission. What is mission? It's what we talked about earlier with Paul, that we have a heart's desire birthed in us by God to abandon me, myself, and I and go out there and make a difference in the lives of others. We say, God, it's not about me, it's about you Hell is hot, eternity's long, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure my friends don't go there. Lord, would I go out there with a fervor to attempt to reach them? That's the kind of spirit that we're talking about here. That red ring, let's talk about that for a moment. Spiritually dead. I love you enough to use that term. If you're here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are dead, that your destination is hell, that there is no redemption for you that you need to surrender your life to Jesus. It says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him. There comes a moment in each of our lives where we're confronted with a decision regarding Jesus. Do you believe he is your Lord and Savior, or don't you? That's the only question that God's going to ask you when you get to heaven. For those that do say, Jesus, you are my Lord, my Savior, I surrender my life to you, you become born again. You become an infant in the faith, just like an infant in the natural. What does an infant need? They need the parents to do everything for them. If an infant is uncomfortable, they cry. If an infant poops, you got to change their diapers. If an infant is hungry, they will cry at you. And pretty quickly, you learn that you are no longer the center of the universe. You are no longer the center of that circle. Once you have a child, that child takes that place for a season, right? Not to be worshipped, but because they demand attention in your life if you're a healthy parent and you're trying to provide for that child. Is this making sense to all you moms and dads in the house today? If you're not and you're out of wedlock, you better think about that in advance. You heard that baby crying, did you not? Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. That's why the Bible tells us to do things in decency and order and in the proper way to all our young people out there in Jesus' name. So an infant, as they begin to grow, they become children, right? I think much of modern-day Christianity, unfortunately, is plagued with a childlike faith. I think it's the challenge of our era, and it's the challenge of our age. I think it's why uh, many seeker-sensitive churches, they thrive right now exceptionally. I think that um, there's a plague inside of much of modern-day Christianity where people are not compelled to grow up. They're not compelled to become parents in the faith. We are content with leaving people in a childlike or infant-like state, and it's a very, very dangerous place to be. It's not a good place. It's where Apollos may have been. Maybe he had transitioned from child to young adult. He's out there speaking scripture. He's talking about things. But sometimes his actions don't line up with the words that are coming out of his mouth. Or sometimes he doesn't know enough to rightfully discern or even understand what's going on. 
So what does a child often do? How many of you had to teach your child to say, mine, mine, mine? Anybody in here had to teach your child to say that? Child does that, right? So what happens in adult-based Christianity? Let's say you're here and you're looking for a church. I'll tell you a couple of different things that you might try to discern. You might be in here for two different reasons. If you come in here with a childlike mindset of much of modern-day Christianity, it's what is this church going to do for me? Is it going to be a good place for my children to be? Is it going to be, is the, is the singing right? Um, if the singing's not right and I don't like the songs that they're singing, then guess what? This isn't the church for me. If the lighting's not right or the temperature's not right or the people don't greet me in the right way, it's all about me. It's mine. If it doesn't line up with my wants, my needs, my desires, then this is not the church for me. And guess what? There's always going to be another church that's going to cater to that. And someday there's going to be a better church that's going to better do the church shopper experience, and then one day you're going to leave and you're going to go to that other place, but guess what? You take yourself wherever you go. So if you got issues and you got challenges and you got problems and you're running from one place to another because you're trying to geographic change, guess what? You're going to have issues here too. And God's gracious enough and loves you enough that he will bear with you and he will try to coach you and guide you and put people in your path. He'll make you run around that same mountain round and round and round again until you pass that test. He does not grade on a curve. He loves you and will not leave you. He will not relent. So I don't care how you got here, but let me tell you a much better approach to showing up here. You showed up here because maybe you moved here or you're new to the region or you name it and you walk in the doors and you say, Yeah, I I see this problem, and I see this challenge, and I see these immaturities, but man, God, are you calling me here? Are Are you calling me to make a difference? I see these deficits inside of kids' church, and are you calling me here to meet those needs that are here? I see that they don't have this small group yet that is for married couples, or you name it. Are you calling me here so that I could sow into the lives of those married folks? A very different approach to church. Sometimes we surrender our own personal preferences because God's called us to a place so that we can live as parents and make a difference. Do you see the difference between the two? See, we need to begin to approach life and approach things as parents do. What does every healthy parent want? And I know sometimes these things are hard to grasp because I, like many who are here today, didn't have a healthy upbringing. I never knew my real natural dad until I was 40, and then I don't even want to know him once I met him. We all, or many of us here, we grew up in divorced homes. We grew up with parents who were absent. We grew up with parents who were not believers. We weren't given the best of examples. But now that we're here, we're trying to learn these things and grow as part of maturing. But every parent who is healthy wants nothing more than to see their child grow up from being an infant, a child, a young adult who could be positioned to go out there into society, ultimately become a parent and produce healthy, like-minded adults, right? We want them to be healthy from day one to the time that they leave. We want them to be equipped to leave the house as Apollos was in a spiritual sense to go to the next city to be able to go there and preach the gospel and make a difference, right? We want to see them healthy. So what happens in the young adult stage? It's a beautiful stage. Sometimes there's a lot of zest. There's a lot of zeal. There's a lot of fire in the belly, but they think they know it all, right? They think they know it all. How many of you had teenagers? You know what I'm talking about, right? So some of you are in the middle of that right now, right? They know it all. You don't know it all. I didn't know it all. I still don't know it all. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, we, we need, there's things to learn and grow and know and understand, right? So you don't want to squelch that, though, if they have that zeal and that fire. You want to cultivate it, and you want to redirect, and you want to point them in the right direction, and you want to help them. That's what that young adult stage is as they go into maturity and be parents. So here at Journey, we pray for two things. We pray that God would send us a lot of people who don't know him because people are living on mission. They're going out there. They're sharing the good news. They're inviting them to join us in this fellowship. But we also have a desperate need for parents because what much of modern-day Christianity lacks is parents. And what happens if you have a bunch of children that are born in a place and there's no parents around? Have you ever seen that? You ever been around one of those rooms where there's a whole bunch of crazy kids that don't have no parents? You better run for the hills. You start pulling your hair out. I mean, like, what? Where are these parents, right? You hear what I'm saying? So here's the rub for all of us. If you're a believer and you're in this place, um, there's no wrong starting point. 
And you're not a parent in every area. You might be a parent in some areas of your life, and there's other areas of your faith where you're childlike. There's no bad starting point to what I'm talking about here. We need to be honest in our assessment of ourselves under the power of the Holy Spirit as we look at our lives and say, Lord, am I imaging you well? If I'm not, what what areas am I not reflecting your glory well? And would you give me the power and the courage to go to war against the sins in my life that are hindering me from demonstrating who you are well? Because I want to do this, not because I feel obligated to do it, because I want to do it as an act of worship. I love you because you first loved me. I love you because you died for me, you saved me, you redeemed me, and I want to live for you and serve you all the days of my life as an act of worship. That's the only true and right motivation. Out of that love for God, a desire to image him well, we're no solo lone rangers in Christianity. Lord, I want to live a life of community. Would you help me get over the fears? Would you help me get over the sins? Would you help me get over whatever it is that's holding me back from plugging in to real Christian community because I'm committed to grow. I'm committed to grow to be a parent in the faith. And then ultimately, might we all be compelled to live a life on mission where we get ourselves out of the center of that circle. We put God there at the center of that circle and we go out there and share the good news with all that we encounter. That is our hope. That is our desire. That is boot camp 101 here at Journey Church. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? See, when all of these things are hitting on all cylinders, we call that spiritual maturity. It's not something that we can do by ourselves. Each of us needs a Paul or a Barnabas, a gospel coach in our lives. And unfortunately, in modern day Christianity, there's a deficit of that, even in our own congregation. So some of this needs to be done in and of our own accord, where we commit in and of ourselves and ask for God's help and diligently plugging in and reading the Bible and and seeking hard after him and learning and growing. Would he give us that kind of a spirit, not one that, you know, we just, I've got to do this out of obligation. That's not the kind of spirit that we're talking about, but out of a true earnest desire to worship him, love him, know him more, know more about him, that we would abandon the idols that are holding us back, that we would abandon the sin that's holding us back, that we would surrender those things at the feet of Jesus. It says, by his stripes we are healed, that he bled that we might have life, that we might be forgiven. And today, um, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, it's the reason we're here. Our heart's desire is that you would surrender your life to him right here, right now, and start this journey of faith with us. The majority of the people in this room, I have no doubt, you are believers in Jesus Christ. The earnest desire of your heart is that Christ be at the center. But when we look at our lives, there's these functional saviors who have creeped up to the place of idolatry in many of our lives. And the rub becomes, when we're confronted with them, will we be quick to repent and turn from our sins? Or do we harden our heart and continue on in them? And God confronts you on various issues in your life. Are you going to run to him, or are you going to just say, I'm not changing, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, there ain't nothing wrong, God's got me this far, God can't judge me. Are we going to truly surrender our heart to him and get the help that only he could provide, that he could do for us what we could not do for ourselves? So if you're here today, you're struggling, you're dealing with some of the things that I'm talking about, or Maybe going back to that tithing example for a moment, you you realize that you're not positioned to because other things have crept into that that place of worship that only he should have. Are you willing to get rid of some of those things to put things right in your life? Pray that many of us are today. Is that you? You just realize and acknowledge that there's some things that need to change and you need God's help today. You need the hope that can only come from him or You're here today and you just know that today's the day you need to surrender your life to him for the first time. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. If that's you, would you just raise up your hand with nobody looking around? I'll pray for you. I see your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours, sir, and yours. Thank you, Lord, for the many who raised their hands. I want to encourage you before you leave to come up to the front and Go over to the side. We have some things that we'd love to give to you, some next steps in your walk of faith. So don't leave this place the same way that you walked in. Lord, for all of us, we just reiterate in our faith that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. 
Our hope is found in you and you alone. Lord, would you come by the power of the Holy Spirit and change us and transform us and give us new life. The areas that are dead in our life, would you make them to be born again? Would we be born again of the Spirit and have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the various sins and challenges that we're faced with in our life? Would you realign our priorities, our wants, our needs, our desires so that they line up with your life and your word? Father, we thank you in advance for what you're doing in this place and the change and the life transformation that we're going to see as a result of what's taken place here in this room this morning. We seal all that's happened and we come against the enemy, the thief, the liar, and any desire that he has to thwart the efforts that are going on in this room right this very moment. Lord, would we just see major breakthroughs and hear wonderful testimonies of all that you've been doing in the lives of the people of Journey Church. Would these stories build in our heart and compel us to go out there and reach others with your great love. We love you, we honor you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us. Enjoy.